Good morning, good morning, good morning. I say good morning. It's morning for us when we're recording. And when I say us, I mean, of course, me, David Robertson. And me, Chris Carter. And uh, you'll hear this husky quality in my voice. It sounds more uh, late night jazz bar than it does early morning academia, but mm. such is the nature of uh, seasonal colds, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, you've not, you're not a patch on Iggy Pop and his, uh, his uh, BBC Six music program that I would heartily recommend. I'm not a patch on Iggy Pop in any respect. And the only thing I have in common with them is the fact that we're both five foot five. <laughs> there we go. Uh, speaking of other people who may or may not be five foot five, um, we've got a new interviewer today, um, Andrew Henry who may be familiar to many of you from the Religion for Breakfast YouTube channel. And he's been speaking with Megan Goodwin about the challenges and responsibilities that accrue for the public scholar of religion. Take it away, Andrew. Welcome, listeners. I'm recording from Boston at North Northeastern University. I'm with Dr. Megan Goodwin. She's a scholar of gender, sexuality, and race and contemporary American minority religions at Northeastern University. She is a visiting lecturer at Northeastern University and the program director of a new initiative called Sacred Rights. W-R-I-T-E-S. Right, okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about this new initiative. So Liz Bucar and I last year uh, worked on a grant that Liz proposed to ACLS and Luce for Religion, Journalism, and International Affairs. And working on this reporting religion project, we started conversations around what would best help shift the conversation around religion, right? How to make the most impact with the work that folks are already doing in the academy and make sure that that's not a conversation that's only happening within the academy, right? So we spent last year proposing a project that helps train scholars to translate their work for non-experts and to think about partnering with media outlets who are already doing really smart reporting, often on religion, but are just undersourced. And even when they're not undersourced, they're not trained as experts in religion. So how do we make the most out of both media expertise and religion expertise and make that the most useful for folks who are not experts in media or religion? <clears throat> so you're looking to, to bridge, like create a bridge between the academy and not just the general public, however mm -hmm. we define that, but specifically uh, journalists, uh, media outlets. So we're thinking of it, I think, broadly as a communication breakdown, right? I've got a Led Zeppelin thing happening in my head. <laughs> uh, so we are in a political moment where religion is deeply shaping so many facets of public life. At the same time, Religion is not something that gets taught as a subject of scholarly inquiry, right? It's something personal. It's something you do in the home. It is not something that we're taught how to think about. So the folks who have been taught how to think about it have developed that expertise but aren't trained to do that translation work. And frankly, largely speaking, institutions haven't valued that work as scholarship. It's seen as potentially community service or an amusing side hobby for tech nerds, but not something that's serious scholarship that people who are really invested in being intellectuals would ever really invest in. So the way that we're thinking about the work that Sacred Rights does is both helping scholars shift public conversations around religion, helping non-experts understand why they need to know something about religion in order to understand the election process or the conversation about health care, right? And at the same time, hopefully teaching institutions how to value that work as legitimate scholarship as opposed to something we do for funsies. Right. Yeah, so you've brought up a lot of interesting ideas here, that, and I want to try to take them systematically. And the one that you mentioned was how the discipline of religious studies, the academic discipline, values engaging the public. Um, you, you mentioned that it would, it would count as you know, service to the dis discipline, community service. But presumably, if you're going up for tenure, the the monographs from a good university press would count much more toward than, mm -hmm. you know, running a podcast like this, for example. Right. And best case scenario is that it's seen as public service or a, a civic good. Worst case scenario, it works against your tenure case and um, 
I certainly know folks who have raised this as an issue for reasons they've been denied tenure, that participating in public facing work suggests a lack of investment in scholarly gravitas, right? So what we're hoping as part of the outcome of sacred rights is using this incredible pool of expertise that we've gathered in our leadership team to take those areas of expertise and, frankly, the weight of those scholarly identities back to institutions and help them understand that this is serious scholarship and cultivate press practices for scholars who are interested in doing this work so that their work can be legible, again, to non-experts, but also to their institutions. Um, my thinking on this is largely informed by the work that Hannah McGregor is doing currently. Uh, she uh, hosts a podcast called um, Secret Feminist Agenda, hmm. which I stand. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that's really remarkable about Secret Feminist Agenda is it's currently being experimentally peer-reviewed. So there is a peer-reviewing institution that is crafting a mechanism by which this work that she's doing, which is so smart but also so accessible, can be valued by her tenure-granting institution. Uh, and I'm hoping that, possibly in conversation with her, but certainly in conversation with our leadership team, we can think about what peer-reviewing a podcast or a YouTube series might look like so that it can count toward tenure, promotion, scholarly gravitas, being a valued part of the institution and not just, again, best case scenario, something that you do for fun or something that you do in your spare time as community service. So I want to focus in on this idea of why is public facing scholarship, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube series, why is it looked down upon by some corners of the academy? Is it because there's there's a lack of of nuance, like there's nuance being lost in that translation process from the scholarly to the public? Um, so we in the academy are are trained to be critical, mm -hmm. trained to pull apart arguments, and I wonder if that plays into the the skepticism of these public facing outlets because you must necessarily go through this translation process to make uh, academic resource, research more accessible. Mm -hmm. And through that translation process, nuance is lost, and therefore it invites more criticism and scrutiny from scholars. So I think there are a couple moving pieces here. Uh, the training toward criticism, I think, is, is a well-made point. Uh, but I also think there's a, frankly, a, a counterproductive valuation of, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. <laughs> I think we often interpret nuance as... Uh, you could say it meanly too. Okay. We don't value clear writing and we don't value clear communication and... Part of that, I think, is academic hazing. Um, I think being the folks who had to read Hegel and Heidegger in order to read Derrida, in order to make something of contemporary postmodern feminist thought, for example, I bring this up for no reason whatsoever, certainly didn't impact my reading at all. Um, there's an expectation that your writing will reflect the complexity of your thought, right? And so I think we tend to elide complex thinking with complex writing. As someone who was trained in critical theory, as someone who attempts to write theory, it is so much harder to communicate abstract, nuanced thinking in clear, concise language. It is incredibly challenging and possibly not something that everyone can do. I think there is a suspicion of folks who try to communicate with non-experts, despite the fact that if for no other reason, this is where funding comes from, right? You never get funding for religious studies work from a religious studies specific to your mini discipline funding institution. You have to be able to say, this is the work that I'm doing and here is why you should care. It is, I think, a failing on our part that we can do that work in order to fund our own research, but we can't do that work to shift the public conversation about why folks should care about religion. I also think, frankly, that there is certainly not at Northeastern, but 
in some institutions a devaluation of teaching over research and not thinking about those two pieces as part of a whole scholarly identity. So when I'm thinking about public facing work, I am thinking of it first and foremost as a pedagogical challenge. How do I take these incredibly complicated ideas and get to the root of here's why the public should care? Here's why this should inform, frankly, how they're voting, right? How they are living in their communities, how they are thinking about and I've been watching a lot of The Good Place, so forgive me, but how does this help us think about what we owe to each other as a society, right? Hmm. If you work in an institution where not only is public-facing scholarship devalued, but frankly, pedagogy and teaching is devalued, how do you learn to see the value in translating your work to a non-specialist audience, right? And again, most of us are required to do that every week. You get in front of an audience of very highly paying non-experts, and you explain to them why they should care. We in the academy talk a really good game very often about pedagogy or teaching and how much we value it, possibly job interviews. I don't see that, frankly, translated into a whole lot of departmental um, politics. Right? The folks that are most highly valued at most institutions, small liberal arts colleges aside, are the folks that are churning out the most research. And Frankly, there's not a whole lot of departmental or institutional support for learning how to be good at teaching. And again, small liberal arts colleges are an exception here. So again, I think the significance of the work that we're trying to do with sacred rights is potentially one we can think about as a pedagogical challenge, right? How do we teach these scholars to be teachers, not just of their students, but of the public? And then how do we teach the institutions to recognize this, to be able to read this as legitimate scholarship. And I don't, frankly, think that you have to sacrifice nuance. You have to be patient that pacing is different. And this is also, I think, a place where American religion scholars maybe uh, have a particular challenge. So um, some of my, my very closest friends in the academy are Islamicists. And they get very grumpy at me because I can say things like, the civil war. And I can just expect everybody in the audience to know what I mean when I say the Civil War. I should be able to rely on them to know the time period, the basic political arguments there, as opposed to, and I'm thinking very specifically of my friend Elise Morgenstein first, who just wrote a book about, uh, uh, let's see, religion, rebellion, and jihad, and how Muslims were coded specifically as inherently rebellious against the crown. Um, in the 1857 rebellion, I'm given to understand was quite an important moment in Indian history. And the reason that I know that is because I read her book, right? So she can't just say the rebellion. There is this necessary instruction of readers who are not experts in Islam or in Indian history or South Asian history. Americanists don't have to do that. So I am thinking particularly of my own scholarship. I have had to learn from these experiences of folks who don't work on American religion to say, what am I assuming when I go into these conversations, right? How can I help folks understand these incredibly intricate, multifaceted historical moments without losing them, without not being able to explain why they should care, right? Yeah, and this pedagogical challenge raises issues of religious literacy mm. at this point where you know, you can mention the Civil War in an American context and assume that there's a baseline knowledge there. Um, but having taught undergraduates, that's often dangerous to assume yeah, that there's baseline that there's baseline knowledge there. <laughs> yeah. So how does that introduce a, a further challenge to this work of public engagement that you want to bring in nuance, you want to bring in complexity, but sometimes you just don't even know a difference between – your audience doesn't know a difference between Catholicism and Protestants. Like, Yeah. So you know what? Honestly, I think you have to earn nuance. If the American public doesn't know the difference between Catholics and Protestants, and the scholarship of religion in the United States is, let's be generous, call it 100, 150 years old, what have we been doing for 150 years that the public doesn't know the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant, right? That's on us. And I understand that the makeup of uh, the United States has complicated public education about religion for some very important reasons. At the same time, and I'm thinking very specifically of 
I'm the product of a public school, right? I did my doctorate at UNC. So the first conversation we had every single semester was how does the work that we're doing when we teach serve Carolina and serve the voters, right? These are folks who are going to be citizens or participate in the public sphere in some way. So how are we helping them do that? I think, I hope that public scholarship done well can first build baseline knowledge about how religion has functioned in the United States, how religion continues to function around the world, how that is wrapped up in things like power and colonialism and imperialism. And then hopefully we can get to a nuanced conversation of like, you're really not understanding healthcare if you don't know something about the U.S. Catholic Conference, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops. You just don't. But, but first, yeah, you need to know what a Catholic is. So good, earn that. And then you can have a conversation in public about why you need to know about the Catholic bishops' interference around reproductive justice. Okay, we're going we're gonna to think more broadly here then. Okay. How would you rate the, the academic discipline of religious studies? Like how successful is it at public engagement in the past, let's say, five or six years? And we're both religious studies scholars here, so it's hard for us to see exactly how other disciplines are doing it, but I have at least enough friends in history departments that seem to be doing a pretty good job. The the dozens upon dozens of solid academic uh, history podcasts, for example. How would you rate the discipline of religious studies in this endeavor? Because there might be, the reason why I ask is there might be many people out there listening to this Mm -hmm. saying, hey, we're doing this already. Like we're both on Twitter. There's there's a ton of religious studies scholars on Twitter. There are. Um, So... To, to respond to those people that might say, hey, this is this is already happening. There's already committees at the American Academy of Religion doing this hard work. Yeah. I think you're right. I think history has been a really impressive force in trying to shape public conversations around nuance, right, and historical nuance. I was particularly impressed with the conversation around um, medieval race and racism, Um, That Twitter conversation blew up and resulted in a number of, I think, really smart pieces and engaged thousands of people from all over the world. That was really impressive. The places where I see this being done really well, if I'm thinking Twitter, I'm thinking of the scholars who take the time to really translate their incredibly nuanced thinking to 240 characters now, right? So top of my list. Judith Weisenfeld, obviously. Anthea Butler, obviously. Nisha Jr., obviously. It is, I don't think, an accident that these are all black women who are incredibly nuanced thinkers, but also participate in this really rigorous, but again, very accessible, usually public conversation. Um, Ed Curtis, uh, through the Journal of Africana Religions, is another really good example of folks that have taken the time to engage with non-experts and explain for example, why using the word cult uh, in a headline while clickbaity, while eye grabbing, compromises the integrity of the folks participating in a group, doesn't think about the racist imperialist history of categorizing religions, particularly religions that involve largely black people, uh, as cults when white religions, civilized religions get to count as actual religions and not cults. Um, other places where this has been really good. The African American Studies podcast, AAS 21 at Princeton, was, I, I think, has been really impressive. But again, my favorite episode of that was Judith Weisenfeld's episode with Eddie Gloud. Uh, the Mazan Project, uh, I think, is in, in a transition period right now. But one of the things that was really exciting about that project was that it paired um, open access, rigorous scholarship with. Um, more contemporary kind of pop culture analysis. So there was kind of something there for everyone. And again, the commitment to open access, I think, is deeply, deeply important if we're going to think about public facing work as a civic good. Um, But also like shout out to the imminent frame, not that blogging is, I think, particularly innovative anymore, but they have been leading the conversation for what, a decade in trying to not necessarily address the public at large, but at least the field of religious studies at large and help religious studies scholars broadly understand some of these really complicated, nuanced uh, issues in the context of religious studies. And this is not to say that the JAR doesn't do that as well, but the JAR really rewards dense, nuanced writing in a way that just doesn't work in a blog format, right? So when I'm thinking about teaching 
for example, contemporary sexual scandals, which is where a lot of my own work lives and also something that informs my religion and sexuality class, one of the first places I go is to the eminent frame to review all of the stuff on the clergy sex abuse scandal. This is scholarship that was in formation, right? The That conference happened, God, what, five years ago at Yale? And you've got some of the, the brightest scholars who work on religion and sexuality thinking out loud about what to do with this material and coming at it from all different angles. So those would be my my big hits. Great. Yeah. Well, so the way that it was phrased in the email was whether or not religion is a special issue, mm-hmm. which like did a very Antaves thing in my head. So like yeah. Antaves would definitely say that it's a special issue. It is an issue of specialness. Um, that is a dumb American religions joke. I'm not even sorry. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, yes, it is a special issue in an American context for two reasons. Uh, the first is that religion is going to be a politics nerd here, but religion and the protection of specific kinds of religion is enshrined in our founding documents, right? So we as a people have collectively agreed that religion does a thing that many other kinds of human culture does not. But the other piece is that, frankly, everybody thinks they're an expert in religion based largely on their personal experiences. I have thoughts about why this is. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with Protestantism and individual relationships with God and individual experiences being valid. Um, But it does lead to things like, never getting over this, a reporter for Maine Public Radio asked me a couple years back to comment on, I think it was a PRRI survey that had identified Maine as like one of the least uh, religious states in the country. And she asked me why I thought that is. And I said, well, Maine is also one of the whitest states in the country and did a tight three on why whiteness and identifying as a religious or spiritual but not religious might be connected. And she said, no, I don't think that's it. So, yeah. So I, I, I think the, identif- the identification of professional experience as synonymous with expertise in religion does make this a particular challenge for religious studies scholars. Yeah, well, we mentioned earlier this idea of pedagogical challenges in this this field of public engagement. And I think you hit the nail on the head with one, which is people already assume they know what religion is. Right. So what is our role to, like, who are you to come in and tell me what religion is? So let's, let's reflect more on that. I think this is an interesting thread. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that is both special because religion and then part of a larger conversation about a systematic devaluation of expertise in the public sphere for mm, call it 50 60 years uh but yeah religion is this this very particular challenge because everyone feels authorized to speak on it so as religious studies scholars again we have to earn the nuance right so let's start with What you think about religion does not exhaust all of religion. So let's start by thinking about multiplicity before we even get to complexity, right? What you know, even about Christianity, is not all there is to know about Christianity. So can we offer windows into religion is more complicated than you think. Religion is always more than you think that it is. And then conservatively, I don't know, 10 years from now, maybe we could get to here's why it's important that we not emphasize religion equals faith or religion equals belief. Here's how we, as a community, not just as a a small chunk of experts, can think about what work it does to value religions that emphasize belief over religions that emphasize practice. And then 50 years from now, we can worry about that U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops, I guess. It is... it is. One of the particular challenges, I think, of doing public scholarship is this question of time, right? The reason, frankly, that I was moved to really pursue public-facing scholarship was that I taught a class called Election, Race, Religion, and Politics in 2016. And we, the entire class is about providing historical context for the election that was happening that year. It's a long game. Right. And then the election made me wonder if we had that kind of time. Right. So I got deeply invested in having conversations 
with folks who don't work on religion about how religion helped shape what led up to the election and certainly what came after. It made me feel a real sense of urgency, a need to intervene. And I think I want to believe that public-facing scholarship can be that kind of, of critical, positive intervention. At the same time, as you raised, the level of religious literacy, just awareness of the, the scope of religious difference is, the bar is so, so low. We have so, so much work to do that it can feel like we're never getting anywhere. We're never going to be able to raise the bar to the point where we can really talk about lived complexity. But since the alternative is doing nothing, I say let's intervene and hope for the best, right? This is better than just letting us all go down with the ship. Let's shift the conversation as much as we can shift the conversation. If the religious studies Overton window is simply, hey, religion is more than I thought it was, I'm going to call that a win. Let's p- pivot the conversation to the idea of the public intellectual. I hate this term. I, I prefer the term public scholar because at least that points to our scholarship and not to our intellect. But doing this work, especially here in the 21st century, is is difficult. It opens you up to a lot of criticism, not only from your colleagues, but from the, the hordes of trolls, whether mm. they're on YouTube or Twitter. And you're competing against public intellectuals in this space that are either not scholars of religion and feel very comfortable to talk about it. So, Richard Dawkins. Right. What? What, what comes to mind immediately? Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, the, the the meteoric rise of Jordan B. Peterson, mm-hmm. who has entire uh, lectures on the Bible on YouTube that get, get millions of views. Yeah, bless his heart, as we say. And, the and then we also have Reza Aslan, who's problematic in his own ways. So we have this issue of public scholars that we have this issue of public intellectuals that we have to raise up our colleagues who are willing to be in this space to, to take those places of public scholars. So in, instead of turning to Richard Dawkins or Jordan B. Peterson, they go to someone that is trained in religious studies and who is skilled at doing this work of translation of keeping complexity and nuance and still being able to engage the public as it were. Um, but this offers so many challenges. So let's, I'd be curious to hear your, your thoughts on this concept of the public scholar and how this job is not cut out for everybody. Yeah. So I think there are two issues that you raise there and they're both really important. I want to start with the vulnerability issue. Um, it is not a safe thing to do this work and it is doubly, triply unsafe to do it as a person of color, as a queer person, as a woman, um, because the internet is not for us, right? Uh, we are reminded of that every time we speak in public, that we should settle down and maybe smile more. There is an incredible vulnerability to doing any sort of public intellectual, public scholarship work. There's an incredible vulnerability to being for example, a black woman scholar standing up and saying, I know a thing and you should know it too. That is, it should not have to be an act of courage, but it is an act of almost imaginable courage, unimaginable courage to stand in front of the internet in all its horrid glory and say, I know more about this than you do. Let me help you. Which actually brings me to my second point pretty neatly. You mentioned public intellectuals versus public scholars. Uh, And I think the dichotomy I'd rather set up is public intellectuals versus public scholarship. Public intellectuals is about a, a, you know what I'm going to say? It's about a cult of personality. I see you, Jordan B. Peterson. I see you. It is about building up your personal brand. It is about showing everybody that you're the smartest, usually straight white boy in the room. I don't think public scholarship necessarily needs to be about individual scholars. I think it is important for us to recognize the contribution of specific figures, particularly folks who are taking bigger risks to say what needs to be said. But public scholarship, hopefully, is just raising the caliber of public knowledge, raising the quality of public conversation, promoting the public understanding of religion. And that doesn't need to be about one individual scholar. That needs to be about all of us doing better because we'll know better. Right? 
And in order to do that work, we need institutional support. This is a conversation that Alice Hunt and I had uh, last month, two months ago. So the American Academy of Religion is very publicly supporting the promotion of public understanding of religion. And as you can imagine, I'm deeply invested in that. At the same time, I worry about developing mechanisms for supporting scholars that we've invited, if not required to be vulnerable in this way. If we are going to say that one of our two core goals as an academic learned institution is promoting the public understanding of religion, is engaging the public so that they can know better, how are we going to support people when they get death threats? Because they will get death threats, particularly if they are people of color, particularly if they are women, particularly if they are queer. Right? My concern is that we are ready to call for the public understanding of religion. We are not prepared to support the folks that are doing that promotion. And I don't know what that looks like. And I know that the issue has been raised uh, within the AAR, at least by me, because I have now had this conversation both with David Gushy and with Alice Hunt. But it's complicated, right? How do we promote institutional support for this? And that I think, I hope, is another piece of best practices that Sacred Rights is hoping to help develop. So talking about institutional support leads me to the next angle of criticism. So if you are putting yourself out there to talk about religion in the public, you can get untold amount of hate from random trolls on Twitter, especially Mm -hmm. if you're a woman, person of color, queer person. But you can also receive criticism from your own discipline, Mm -hmm. your own institution. We talked about this earlier. Um, And I feel like this is particularly felt if you are part of the academic precariat, or whether you're... I love that. You're an adjunct. Solidarity. (laughs) Whether you're an adjunct, visiting faculty member, or a graduate student like myself, Mm -hmm. there's there's a risk to Mm -hmm. do this. Um, I frequently think about how with my YouTube channel, I could say something stupid accidentally on one video and torpedo my career. So... How do we support the the more contingent faculty side of the um, public engagement world of our discipline? Because I see a lot of public engagement happening from these scholars who don't have full-time positions, who don't have tenure to protect them. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important question that I don't have a strong answer to aside from hoping that the mechanism of sacred rights is at least in part teaching institutions to value this work. I think there's a strong correspondence here with um, media personalities as well, right? Very often in order to land a position at any sort of uh, media outlet of impact, you have to have already cultivated something of a brand. Often that brand has been deliberately provocative. That's how you get followers. That's how you get noticed. And then once you are elevated to this noteworthy publication, very often women, queer people, people of color, are lambasted publicly for having said horrible provocative things like white people are white. Horrible. Uh, For those who do not spend their entire lives on Twitter, there was a specific uh, Asian woman science journalist who had a very provocative Twitter presence, landed a very plum gig at an important publication, and then had to publicly apologize for having told white people that they were white. Uh, So this is something that I think about a lot. At the same time, and this is not, I think, universally applicable advice. (sighs) While I was teaching about the election, I was in a visiting position. uh, And it just broke me. It broke me. Um, It broke me in concert with the job market, which I have spent more time than I'd prefer Uh, exploring. And I got to a stage where the sense of urgency that I felt around being publicly engaged around religious education, or education about religion, I should say, that urgency outweighed my caution. Uh, And I am deeply aware of the ways in which that has increased my own precarity. And at the same time, it has facilitated so many incredibly intellectually rich, personally fulfilling conversations around this issue and created all of these support networks in the academy that I would not have 
access to had I not engaged, say, Twitter in this way. So I can't recommend it. Like I am, for all that I am in this position of precarity, I am at a an R1 institution, having been funded by a very large grant, having been sponsored, frankly, by some really impressive senior women scholars in Islam. And I am married and unlikely to wind up on the street eating cat food, right? Like I was in a position where I could do that. I don't know that that's available to everyone. And I worry that the voices that are really taking risks, that have really innovative approaches to shaping this conversation are the ones who are most at risk and who are potentially the most likely to suffer for having tried to do this incredibly important work. I don't know that that's a fulfilling answer, but that's where I'm at with it. No, I think that's a good answer. So just in terms of how do we do this work? How do we, where do we start? If we're thinking about what makes an engaging piece of public facing scholarship, I think we need to start by thinking about the audience which is not something that scholars are trained to do, right? Sure, we think about audience in that we're engaging a community of our peers who have similar levels of training. But if we're not only ever talking to religious studies experts, we need to think about who do we want to talk to and what do we want to get across? And we have to be willing to do that in non-specialist language, which again is, is deeply challenging. But I mean, some of this is really simple, right? The thing that makes a good piece of public scholarship is the same thing that makes any good media. Can you tell a clear, concise story and explain why the viewer or the listener or the reader should care? So being able to think about, all right, I am deeply invested in conversations about religious freedom and how they tend to privilege specific forms of Christianity, right? Shout out to Beth Shockman Hurd. How do I take all of that incredibly dense, nuanced, smart literature and bring that out to mm, an audience that's going to think religious freedom sounds good. Let's do that. So thinking about, okay, am I going to do this as a blog post? Do I do this as a YouTube channel? What's an infographic and how do I put that together? Something that Sacred Rights is still working on, but we're, we're interested. Please stay tuned. Thinking about where your energy is, how you can best communicate that idea in the clearest, most concise, most engaging way possible is going to make a good piece of public scholarship. Again, I'm coming back to Hannah McGregor because I'm a huge fan. But one of the things that she said about her podcasting work is that despite the fact that she's bringing her scholarly expertise in publishing to all of this work, she keeps having a hard time thinking of it as scholarly because it's fun, because she's enjoying it. And I wonder what it might look like to bring that kind of enjoyment, that kind of energy, that kind of fun, frankly, to doing this often really serious, really hard work. I mean, I am somebody who works on sex abuse and violence in minority religions, and my case studies involve mothers holding on to beams and weeping because their children have been taken away, and the deployment of armored personnel carriers against American citizens on American soil. So if I can do that by making jokes about Vanilla Isis and Captain Moroni, you know what? That's a way to both explain to the public that they need to care about this, but also stay sane while you're doing it, right? Because otherwise I think that the onslaught and the scope of the problem is just overwhelming. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goodwin. I think this was a great conversation on the the implications of public scholarship here in the 21st century, especially for religious studies scholars, as we try to bring more academic scholarship to, to more people. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No problem. And thanks so much to Andrew for recording that interview for us. It's great to have him as a new member of the team. And next week, we have another new member of the team joining us. Yes, we do. We've got Candice Mixon. So let's hear from her. Hello, my name is Candace Mixon, and I am a doctoral candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Department of Religious Studies. My specialization is in Islamic studies, gender, and material culture. My current research project is titled Mother for Father, Contemporary Devotion to Fatima al-Zahra in Iran, and in it I examine visual culture and materiality in order to observe how images, art, and objects do not only play a role in Muslim devotional practices, 
but what kinds of changing values and concerns we can observe through utilizing visual and material evidence. My research focused specifically on images, objects, and rituals within the context of contemporary Shia Muslim practices in Iran, and primarily on devotion to Fatima al-Zahra, who is the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. Methodologically, I have traveled to Iran for fieldwork and gathered a variety of materials to analyze for my project, as well as using historical information to conceptualize and better understand the changing nature of devotional practices related to Fatima Zahra. Excellent. And I d- we, we should probably introduce her interview next week. Uh, it's called um, Muslim Dress Beyond the Headscarf. And that's an interview with Liz Bukhar. Um, one of, uh, we've got a wee run of clothing based ones. We had the LDS garments last week. I made the Christian beauty pageants a couple of weeks beforehand. This is, I think, our final clothing themed one for a while, but it's been a nice series there and nice also because these interviews have been coming from, um, new members of the team. Um, I certainly wouldn't have immediately gravitated to do interviews about, um, religion related dress. So it's, Fantastic that we've we've had other input. Indeed. Speaking of other input, if you ever want to input to the project, you might want to write a response. You might want to do some interviews, be interviewed, think of someone who could be interviewed, or you may just want to add your um, witty commentary on social media or on the website. So we encourage that. Um, we encourage your input in all forms. And uh, we'll be putting out our formal sort of call for volunteers, new interviewers, new editors, all sorts of things over the summer, as we usually do. We're a few months away from that yet, but uh, we're starting to think about it nonetheless. So watch out for that. And I think that's us, really. Thanks Thanks for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox, and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop, and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.